We've seen how interpretations are very powerful tools in demonstrating certain semantic properties, and when we do that, we're really constructing models. And models have been really useful in helping us understand what predicates mean and what the universe of discourse mean, and have really clarified semantics and predicate logic for us. But there is one thing which we really still don't have that strong of an understanding of, and our semantics have sort of glazed over, which is what do the quantifiers really mean? Now we intuitively know what for all and there exists mean, but it turns out that we can actually make this quite explicit by doing a truth functional expansion. So we're going to do a truth functional expansion on a universal statement. And this universal statement is very straightforward, for all x, fx, arrow gx. Now we know from our previous lecture that this has an easy abstract translation, which means if you're an f, then you're a g, which means all f's are g's. That's fine, and that helps us understand the conditional as well as the relationship between f and g. But what does the for all really mean? Well, let's consider a universe of discourse of 0 and 1. What does it mean that for all has this property? Well, it actually means that this sentence must be true for every member of my universe of discourse. And because I'm capping my universe of discourse to only two members, 0 and 1, it must be true for 0, and it must be true for 1. Now, what we can do is we can sort of use our skills of sentential logic to help us expand this sentence into a sentence that is, makes sense relative to the universe of discourse. And if you think about this statement, for all x, fx, arrow, gx, and that the universe of discourse is 0 as well as 1, what must it mean for this to be true? Well, a, if a universal means it's true for all members of the universe of discourse, then that means this sentence must be true for 0, and it must be true for 1. So we can capture that by expanding out the sentence uh, about a, a conjunction. So we have a conjunction as the main connective, and that conjunction is tied to my universal. Whenever I have a universal statement, it really means a string of statements must be true, and they are joined by a conjunction. And what are these strings of statements? Well, just the statement where we've essentially instantiated to the first member of our, our universe of discourse, and then we've instantiated to the second member, and so on. So for all x, fx, arrow, gx, means that if 0 is an f, then 0 is a g. And if 1 is an f, then 1 is a g. But it also means even more if my universe is expanded. So if my universe of discourse grows to 0, 1, as well as 2, then the truth functional expansion of my original sentence adds to it, well, if 2 is an f, then 2 is a g. And this goes on and on and on for as large of a universe of discourse that we want. Now, immediately you should see an issue with truth functional expansion, which is I can't really do this for an infinite universe, and even doing it for a universe larger than, say, three objects is going to be large and unwieldy, but we're not going to worry about that for now. The truth functional expansion of the existential also captures the intuitive meaning of the existential. And the intuitive meaning is, there exists. So what does it mean to say there exists something that is an f and a g? Well, of course, that meaning is relative to the size of my universe of discourse. So I'm going to start with a universe of discourse of 0, 1, and I want to expand my sentence into a, a, a sort of nice clean sentence that captures the meaning that at least one member of my universe of discourse, which is 0 and 1, has this property that it is an f and a g at the same time. Now once you actually think about it and say it out loud, you should realize that the trick to the existential is that instead of joining statements about members of my universe of discourse with a conjunction, I'm not going to use and, I'm actually going to use or. Because for this to be true, for there exists an x, fx, and gx to be true, if my universe of discourse is only two members of 0, 1, it must be the case that either 0 has the property in question, or 1 has the property in question. And of course, it's possible that both of them do, but OR in logic is inclusive, so that's not a problem. So the truth functional expansion of their existence x, fx, and gx is just 0 has this property 
of being f and g, or 1 has the property of f and g. And just like we saw before, if we extend our universe of discourse out into three things, so here I added the number 2 just like I did before, then I would just have to add another disjunct to my string of expansion to say, oh, well it could also be 2 that has this property. It could be 2 that is my f and g at the same time. And as I add more members to my universe of discourse, of course I would just add more disjuncts for each member. So this is what a truth functional expansion is. A truth functional expansion replaces quantified statements with an equivalent unquantified statement that looks essentially just like sentential logic. Now, the universal quantifier is always paired with a conjunction, and that's because the universal quantifier means that it must be true for all members of our universe, which means this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and so on. And the existential quantifier always expands to become disjunctions, because it means at least one. And I don't know if it's the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. As long as at least one of them has the property, I'm good. And that is captured by OR. The result is a perfectly equivalent symbolic sentence, or symbolic statement, that looks sentential in that it has no quantifiers. But the beautiful part about this replaced sentence is that because it's sentential, in form, it is now truth functional. And so the truth properties of the overall statement can be computed from its individual parts, essentially like a shortened truth table or a full truth table, as how we did way back when when we did semantics of sentential logic. And this is a really powerful tool. I can now compute complicated semantic properties in a mechanical way, just like I did with shortened truth tables, just like I did with full truth tables, so long as I can expand my quantified statements into this truth functional sentential style sentence. Now, you might have noticed that uh, I did something sort of funny here. Uh, when I expanded for all x, f, x, arrow, g, x to the universe of 0, 1, and 2, I got something that looked like this. And some of you might have realized that this is actually, technically speaking, a not well-formed formula. And the reason why is I've used symbols that are not part of the syntax of my language. The syntax of my language does not include the numerals 0, 1, 2, etc., or, uh, or any sort of thing else that aren't the, you know, lowercase a through h, for name letters, etc., etc. So a better way to do this would actually to be to use a well-formed statement where I could use, say, uh, i subscript 0, i subscript 1. And then I would have to sort of append that, well, you know, we know that i0 stands for 0, the first thing in my universe of discourse. And i1 stands for 1, the first thing in my, uh, the, the second thing in my universe of discourse. And this would go on and on for as many things in the universe of discourse as I have. Now that's fine. You can do it that way to maintain the nice well-formed statements. But I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to say that even though this is technically not well-formed, it's good enough for our purposes. Uh, it's sort of unwieldy to have to write i0, i1 over and over again when you do these expansions, just so that you can note that i0 stands for 0. So even though technically this isn't well-formed, I'm not going to worry about it. We can just insert the members of our universe, 0, 1, and 2, right into our symbolic statement, and that's how we'll do our truth functional expansion. Truth functional expansion is straightforward when there's only a single quantifier, as we saw before. It gets more complicated in two cases, when we have nested quantifiers, and also when the quantifier doesn't range over the entire scope of the sentence. So that's what we're going to do in our next two examples. So how would I truth functionally expand this, where I have a nested quantifier, which means that I have a quantifier that's quantifying over another quantifier. So here you can see that I have the for all x on the outside, and then I have the there exists a y on the inside. Now, you can actually expand in any order. You can do truth functional expansion from the inside quantifier first, and then do the outside, or you can go outside in. I typically go outside in. There's no sort of right answer here. You should really just do whatever comes naturally to you. The trick, though, is that you must correctly expand all uh, sort of members of the sentence that fall under the scope of the quantifier. So let's take a look. The first thing we're going to focus on is that big for all x at the front. And note that my universe of discourse here is 0 and 1. So if I want to expand this, this sentence must be true for 0 as well as for 1. 
And so I know that I'm going to expand to a conjunction. Now what I'm going to do to expand this is I'm going to drop the quantifier and replace every instance of x with the first member of my universe, which is 0. So I'm going to do that now. So I'm focused on the expansion of the universal, and if this universal is true, which we're assuming it is, then this statement must hold when 0 replaces x under that instantiation. All right, well, I'm not done. I know that this must also be the case for all members of my universe. So I'm going to add the conjunction and also expand my sentence, instantiate my sentence, to the second member of my universe of discourse, which is 1. And so I get this. Now you have to be careful. The universal is the main operator in the original sentence. And that means that the conjunction must be the main operator in the, uh, the main connective in my expansion. So right now it is not. You can see that it's sort of uh, awkward where I have the ands and so on, and if I apply the rightmost rule, whatever. But the easiest way to clarify this is you just add brackets. So I'm going to add brackets here, or parentheses, add that, really make it clear that the and in the middle is the main connective, and it's tied to my universal. I'm now ready to expand my existentials. Now I'm just going to focus on the left conjunct first. The left conjunct has an existential in it, and the right conjunct has an existential in it. So I want to expand both of them, but I'll just do the left one. Now if you look at it, the trick to doing this is that the existential, the EY, only covers what's in the brackets, which is the negation BY by conditional G0. So that is precisely what I'm going to expand. And I know that an existential expands to a disjunction. So here's the disjunction, that's fine. And what I've done is I've left F0 AND alone. So I've left that F0 AND alone, and I haven't expanded it in any way. I haven't put it within the scope of the disjunction in any way, precisely because it doesn't fall under the scope of the existential. So you must only expand things that fall under the scope of the quantifier. So now that I've done the left conjunct, I'm going to do the right. Again, I'm going to leave the F1 AND alone, and I'm just going to expand what's in the brackets. So the way to expand it is first I replace the Y with a 0, and then I write a disjunction, and then I replace the Y with a 1. And this is the meaning of that existential statement. It means it can be true for the 0, or it can be true for the 1. Of course, it could be true for both. I don't know, but that's okay. So this final line is the truth functional expansion of the, of the original statement. And technically, it's the only line you would need to provide if you were asked to do a truth functional expansion. But the intermediary lines are often quite useful so that you just don't make mistakes along the way. In this last example, we're going to look where the quantifiers specifically don't range over the full scope of the sentence. This is a uh, sort of should be made clear based off the previous example, but we'll just sort of go through it anyway. Uh, here I have the existential, there exists x, fx, and I'm going to expand that first. But notice the scope of that existential is just the fx. It doesn't range over anything else. So when I expand it, I need to make sure that I expand it to 0 as well as 1, and the disjunction is the main connective. But it's only the main connective of whatever I expanded. In reality, the main connective of the original sentence is a conditional. So the main connective of my expansion should also be a conditional. So here you can see that my expansion, the conditional is still the main connective, and I've preserved that the existential does become a disjunction in the antecedent only. So what does it mean for there exists x, fx? Well, that quantifier means that it 0 must be an f, or 1 must be an f, and that is a property of the antecedent and the antecedent alone. Now I'm ready to expand the universal. Uh, you could have done the universal if you wanted, or you could, uh, first if you wanted, or you could have done them both at the same time. Here I've just split them up, just so that it's nice and clear. Uh, but when you get good at this, you'll be able to expand this in one line. The, the universal will expand, uh, but the trick here is that the universal only modifies, again, what's under the scope, which is the fy by conditional gy. So that means I know I will replace the y with a 0, 
put in a conjunction, and then I will replace the y with the 1, and that's what falls under the scope. Of course, what we have to make sure is that the negation stays where it is. So when I expand this, the negation must stay outside of my expansion because it doesn't fall under the scope of the universal at all. So when I do the expansion, you can see that I've left the negation on the outside. I have F0 by conditional G0 and F1 by conditional G1, and that is the expansion of the universal, and I've succeeded in a truth functional expansion. Now, the natural question is immediately, now what? You know, what are we going to do with this expansion? Uh, why am I doing this? Well, it turns out that there are actually lots of practical reasons why truth functional expansion is good and convenient. Uh, but the most important is that we can use this information to render statements true or false that otherwise might be tr sort of tricky to figure out when it's true and when it's false. And specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to use this to build finite abstract models in a mechanical way. When we're limited to uh, single place logic, which is what we are doing in this video, uh, this is pretty basic, and you might wonder why I would even need to bother truth functional expansion. It doesn't really seem to help me out that much, and that's sort of true. But when we move to multi-place predicate logic, which we'll do in the next video, uh, then truth functional expansion can be quite useful in making sense of things that are hard to figure out on their own. Here are some tips for doing truth functional expansions. Always work in one direction. That means you should always uh, go from outside in or inside out. If you mix it up, uh, you might just sort of confuse yourself. So just pick away and stick with it. You really need to also make sure that the main and the subconnectives correspond to the right quantifier. So the most common mistake people make when they do truth functional expansions is that they don't put enough brackets in place so that they uh, it's clear where the conjunctions are, where the disjunctions are, and where the main connectives are. So you always need to double check your brackets, double check your parentheses, uh, and that is really critical to getting the truth of functional expansion correct. And lastly, you never want to expand beyond the scope of the quantifier. So you can see in my previous example that I was very careful about figuring out what I should expand and what I should leave to the front or to the side, uh, and that is really important so that you don't sort of overreach the scope of a quantifier. Now let's look at one last applied example. So here's a truth functional statement, and I want to make this sentence true. Now this is the expansion from the previous slide, so we've already done it. But what I'm going to show you is the application that truth functional expansion sort of can have for us, which is it really makes figuring out how a sentence is true, or essentially creating a model to make this true, quite trivial. So if I want to make the original sentence true, if I want to generate a model that shows that the original sentence is true, I would have to abstractly translate it and so on and so forth. But that's sort of an awkward one to translate. So instead, I've done the expansion, and now I'm ready. I can instead make this equivalent sentential style sentence true. And we do that in the good old fashioned sentential way. If I want the sentence to be true, I need the main connective to be true. The main connective here is the and. Okay, well, I'll set the and to be true. If the and is true, that means both sides must be true. So I'm gonna look and realize from careful analysis of my parentheses, that the main connective of the left conjunct and the main connective of the right conjunct are themselves conjunctions. So that means that uh, on each side, both conjuncts there must also be true. Given that, the natural starting point is to realize that the easy thing to make true is F0 as well as F1. And what this means is that it must be true that 0 is an F, and it must be true that 1 is an F. And that is enough information for me to start constructing my model. So I start with my model, f, b, and g, and I immediately know that 0 and 1 are both an f, because that's what it takes to get those uh, conjuncts true. Now I just have to tackle the remaining conjuncts to make them all true. I'm going to focus on the first one, which is actually that disjunction. But what you should see is that a disjunction is true if one of the sides are true. So I am arbitrarily going to pick the left disjunct, which is negation b0 by conditional g0, to be made true. Why that one? Why not the other one? There's no reason. I picked it just because it was the first thing. 
Now, how do I make this true? Well, one way to make it true is just to say that zero is in G. And then, of course, that would mean that zero cannot be in B. The meaning of that is just uh, it's in one or the other, can't be both. So I've arbitrarily put it into G, and that's fine. And if you look, that is enough to make uh, that entire disjunct true. Okay, so uh, where do I look now? I'm going to look over at the right side, and I'm going to try and do the same trick. I'm going to try and make the negation B0 by conditional G1 true. Because if I can just make one disjunct true, it's enough to make the entire disjunction true. Now, take a look already. I have this sort of uh, thing here that says negation B0. And I could put something into B or whatever, but it just says 0 isn't B, if and only if 1 is a G. And this is made true quite quickly by just putting 1 into G, because 0 is already not in B and now they're tied together. So what we did here was we constructed a little model based off of the sort of guidelines of uh, this uh, sentential expansion. So to finish, I just have to close my set. Notice that B is an empty set, and that makes sense because I purposefully put nothing in B, and I just put 0 and 1 in G, and that's good enough. When I'm done, this is the solution, and this model demonstrates that this sentence can be made true. So I guess the semantic property that I demonstrated is that this statement is not a contradiction, because here's a model where the sentence is true. Again, you could have picked a different arbitrary starting point. You could have made a particular right disjunction true or something like that, and it doesn't really matter. The nice thing about truth functional statements is they break down sort of like how we did shortened truth tables so that you just know, okay, this thing must be true, this thing must be false, and so on, and then you just fill out your model. So why is this useful? Uh, truth functional expansion is particularly useful when you have sentences that are awkward to translate. So here's one. There exists x, ax, arrow, dx. We don't really know how to abstractly translate in a sort of colloquial language because this doesn't follow any sort of canonical form. It also gives us a deep understanding of quantifiers, so we know fundamentally what quantifiers really mean. And of course, the final payoff is what we just saw. We can generate a finite extensional model in a purely mechanical way uh, so that we don't have to rely on abstract translations and trial and error and so on. Now that sounds great, but it turns out that truth functional expansion isn't nearly as useful as we might want it to be. And this is not really that useful of a skill because it's, first of all, extremely slow. If you have to expand a bunch of sentences, it can take a long time. And it's brutal for large universes of discourse or really long statements. And so it has the same problems that uh, truth tables did in sentential logic, where practically it's unwieldy. Now, there is actually a must deeper limitation to truth functional expansion. Uh, the first is, for truth functional expansion to be useful, you actually have to know ahead of time the right optimal size of your universe of discourse. Some things require a larger universe of discourse to demonstrate a semantic property, and you wouldn't really know ahead of time. So how are you supposed to know how large your universe of discourse to expand to should be? Well, you could pick something really large, but then it'll take forever. And so this is a really practical problem. And of course, there is a sort of non-practical issue, but a theoretical issue with doing truth functional expansion, which is it can only be done on a finite size universe of discourse. But as we know, universe, universes of discourse can be infinite in size. So truth functional expansion will not help us at all if we want to do uh, universes of discourse that are infinite in size. That's it for truth functional expansions. This was a pretty quick introduction on how to do it and some of the skills. It turns out that this is a far more useful skill when we do multiplace predicate logic. So in our next lecture video, we will do the semantics of multiplace and we'll see that truth functional expansions are pretty powerful, even though they have these limitations.